uh, vision of the glory returning. And, and, and this one is a vision that probably, if you've heard anything from the book, you may have heard this one. Um, I want you to see that in the run-up to the vision itself, in 37, 1 to 14, which is where we're going, the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones, I want you to see the run-up to it. Because in chapter 36, he's in the section where he's begun the consolation. Okay, Re remember, the hinge of the book is in 33. He gets a second call on his life and says, all right, you've been giving him the bad news, now I need you to turn on the good news. Let me explain to you why I did what I did with your wife. Let me explain to you why I let the temple fall. Let me explain to you what I'm going to do. Then I want you to load with both barrels and go out there and shoot compassion all over them. Okay? And now we're in the compassion section. So the sense of the narrative changes. This is the consolation, the good stuff. In chapter 36, here he's talking about how he's going to be bringing back Israel and blessing them. So all that down, down, down is now lift, lift, lift. Okay. In 36, 1, it says, And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, and the everlasting heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, for good reason they have made you desolate and crushed you from every side, that you would become a possession of the rest of the nations, that you have been taken up in the talk and the whispering of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord, the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills and to the ravines and to the valleys, to the desolate waste places, to the forsaken cities that have become a prey and a derision to the rest of the nations which are about you. So he says, I want you to prophesy, but I want you to prophesy to the landscape, to the mountains, to the cliffs, to the ravines, to the desert places, to the broken cities. Verse 5, therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and with scorn of soul to drive it out for a prey. He says, I want you to know I, did, I was the one who stood against you as the nations took you away, and I am going to be the one who stands against the nations and the way they've behaved against you. And then in verse 6, Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and the hills, to the ravines and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my wrath, because you have endured the insults of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have sworn that surely the nations which are around you will themselves endure their insults. He said, Just as the Ammonites, Moabites, Edomites, and others have come down on you, those in Tyre and Sidon have mocked you, those from the Philist Philistine plain have mocked you, I am going to turn my attention to those who have harmed you. So it's supposed to build them up. Like, I know they laughed at you, they kicked at you, but now I'm going to deal with them. Then it says, verse 8, but, for you, but you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come. He says, I'm going to start to sprout the land and put back the flora and fauna in the land because I'm going to bring the people back. For behold, I am for you. I would circle the four. I am for you. I will turn to you, and you will be cultivated and sown. I will multiply men on you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the cities will be inhabited, and the waste places will be rebuilt. I will multiply on you man and beast, and they will increase and be fruitful, and I will cause you to be inhabited as you were formerly, and I will treat you better than at the first, Thus you will know I am the Lord. You have to understand why my friends who live in Israel, who have come back from the nations, are excited to see the land being filled with cities and being rebuilt. When you stand on hillsides and watch that they have planted literally thousands of trees on every hillside, this is them preparing for the rest to come back. And it says... Yes, I will cause men, verse 12, my people Israel, to walk on you and possess you so that you will become their inheritance and never again bereave them of children. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you are a devourer of men and have bereaved your nation of children. Therefore, you will no longer devour men and no longer bereave your nation of children, declares the Lord God. I will not let you hear insults from the nations anymore. Do you see the word 
Do you see how it's, it sounds like the word shame, doesn't it? I won't let you bear the insults of the nations anymore. There's coming a day when I'm going to put all the people back in you and I'm going to exalt you and the people are not going to have this problem anymore. Verse 16, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their, uh, their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. That means exactly what you think. Therefore, I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land because they had defiled it with their idols. Also, I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. Notice that. That their scattering was a way of people laughing at God because they believed they were chosen of God, but the nations said if they were chosen of God, then what are they doing here? How come they don't have their own land? They, they believe something that isn't true. And God says, yes, it is true. Verse 21, I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. The Bible says that when the Jewish people were spread out into the nations, they didn't make the nations more holy. The nations made them less holy. They adopted the nations. And today you will see leading some of the most anti-God movements, Jewish people. Verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. Okay, I want you to notice, God didn't say I'm bringing back Israel because Israel is better. I'm not doing it because you're good. I'm doing it because of my holy name. I made promises to Father Abraham and I'm going to deliver all my promises. It's because of my name. I am faithful. Verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. I'm going to deal with you to deal with them. I'm going to deal with Israel, and that's what the world is going to see. And as the world hates you, they're going to see me dealing with you. And then one day, the world's going to see me exalt you, and they're going to know that I'm the Lord. Verse 24, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Do you understand that there is in this, implied in this return, it is not just about the spirit, it's very much about the land. You keep hearing land, 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 okay? Verse 25, so, I've got a return in verse 24, right? Put the word return next to it. Next to verse 25, put the word cleanse. Notice the word cleanse comes after the word return, not before it. Jews who are not walking with God will return to the land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and will make you clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new, spirit, a new heart and a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, return, cleanse, renew. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so that you will be my people and I will be your God. Here's what I want to say. The literal precise promise is that God's going to bring them back, that the land will be theirs and that they will become right before God and he will be their God. Has that ever happened? Has Israel ever as a nation come back and fallen before God and been right before him? No. So either this means nothing or it means it hasn't happened yet. Those are your choices. So two thirds of the church will now say it means nothing. It means it's a spiritualization of how Jesus will come into the heart of a Gentile. If you ask anybody, what is the new covenant? You will get Jesus coming into the heart. It will have nothing to do with the land, it will have nothing to do with return or gathering. It will have nothing to do with Israel. We have resupplied the message with an entirely different message. And it's supplanting the original message. Here's what he says, verse 29. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. Salvation. 
I will scatter, I will call for the grain and multiply it. I will not bring again a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree, the fruit produce of the ground, so that you will not receive again the disgrace. There it is, shame, disgrace, a famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways, your deeds that were good, not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. You're going to see in Zechariah 12, they're going to weep because they know that they were the ones responsible for the piercing of the sun. And he says, I am not doing this for your sake. Just in case you missed it the last two times I said it, I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. A desolate land will be cultivated instead of being desolate in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say the desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. It says the nations are going to notice that the landscape of your land is actually regreening. You're, you're getting gardens where there used to be desert landscapes. You have to look at a picture of what Israel looked like in 1948 and then look at it today. And what you will see is dry desert hillsides have been turned into beautiful gardens. And it says, then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the re ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her high appointed feasts. So will the desolate, uh, the waste cities be filled with the flocks of men. Then they will know that I am the Lord. He says, I'm just going to bring people. I'm going to pack the cities. They're going to be like, there's going to be as many people milling around the cities as there were uh, lambs on feast day. I mean, it's going to be like unbelievable. Now, here's the third vision. The third vision isn't 36. I was just giving you a run up to it to get you the feeling of the consolation. Here's the 37 is the, is the vision. And the vision itself is in 37, 1 to 14. Now watch what he sees. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among the, them around them. And behold, they were many on the surface of the valley, and they were very, very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. He took me to a grave site where there's bones scattered all over the place. And he said, See these old dry bones? Can, can they get up and walk? Can they live? And he's gone, Oh, Lord, you know the answer to this. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> Thus says the Lord God to these dry bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back over you, cover you with skin and put breath in you so that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a rattling and the bones came together you know you know the bones coming together right the leg bones connected to the never mind <laughs> go ahead and the bones start coming in, bone to its bone and bones were just going And I looked, and behold, the bones started to grow muscles, sinews. And the flesh grew, and the skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Zombies, I cried, and I ran. No, it says, and he said to me, prophesy to, to the breath. Prophesy, son of men, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come down from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, the, uh, slain ones that they may come to life. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and breath came into them. <gasps> and they came to life, and they stood on their feet. An exceedingly great army. Apparently they must have picked up clothes somewhere along the line, because he doesn't really mention that part. Because he was looking at them, and it was like an army of nakedness. At any rate... <laughs> 
Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened up your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. God says he's going to bring the people back to the land and after he brings them back, he'll change their heart. I believe we're at the bringing them back, but not the change of heart yet. The important thing for us to remember is when you get down to verse 15, you see that God is already at work in bringing the people back. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it what? For Judah and the sons of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions. Please know that this particular vision is getting torqued all over the Christian world and getting told in many different ways. But clearly in the verse, what does he say? Who are all the people that the two sticks represent? Are there any non-Jews in that picture? No, all of this has to do with the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them to one another into one stick that they may become one in your hand. <clears throat> Why would he say that? What time period are we in? We're, we're out down here at 585 BC. What has already happened? Both, not only has the nations been split, now both of them have been taken into exile. 586 happened. 585, they're, they're now in exile. So Zedekiah is done. The northern kingdom is gone. And 136 years before, the northern kingdom was lost. And he says, I want you to write on one stick, northern kingdom, Ephraim, and the other one, southern kingdom. And I want you to put them back together because I'm going to bring all the Jews, not just the ones that you know where they are. When the sons of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will write, the, take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companion, and I will put them together with the stick of Judah and make them one stick that they will be one in my hand. You have to understand, I don't know any Jewish people today that actually believe that God is going to reunite both Israel and Judah and bring them all back. Because the rabbis have long since taught that the northern kingdom has been totally lost. They don't know where they are. They're gone. Here's what he says. They're not gone. I know exactly where they are, and I'll bring them all back. And I don't care whether they were from the north or from the south. I don't care if they went out 136 years before you went out. I still know where they are since I'm the Lord. It's really not a big deal. But clearly in verse 19, he says, I'm going to bring all them back. Do you understand that for Ezekiel to stand in front of the Judahites, who had lost their cousins in the north 136 years before these guys. This is 137 years ago. God is going to find your ancestors and bring them back. They're all going to go, you've got to be kidding me. We don't even know where those people are. And his point is, yeah, but God does. Verse 20, the sticks on which you write will be, will be in your hand before their eyes. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they've gone. Among, uh, uh, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in one land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king over them all. What's he talking about? He's talking about Messiah. He says, I am going to regather not just the southern kingdom, I'm going to regather Israel, the northern kingdom, and I'm going to bring them back. And you don't know where they are, and you think they're ten lost tribes, and I don't care, because I know exactly where they are, are, and I'm bringing them all back. They will no longer defile themselves. By the way, the end of verse 22 is really important. They will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. Is this clear enough language for you to say what he's trying to say is I'm going to heal the breach between the divided kingdom and bring them all back and they'll all have one king? Does everybody get that? Because I got to tell you, you can go out there and look on the internet. You'll hear some fancy stuff about Gentiles. It's unbelievable because the stick of Ephraim is really the Gentiles that are like the Jews and they're going to... Uh, seriously, I'm telling you, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. 
Here's what he says. I'm going to bring back people you think I lost because I didn't lose track of them. That's all he's trying to say. And he says, verse 23, they will no longer defile themselves with the idols or the detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and I will cleanse them and they will be my people and I will be their God. The rabbis taught that Ezekiel 36, 37, and uh, really uh, Ezekiel 34, 35, 36, and 37 are the reasons why the rabbis started baptizing. You understand that you have never heard of baptism in your study of the Hebrew scriptures, but by the time you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everybody's getting baptized, but you didn't hear any command of God to do that. Where did it come from? It came from Babylon. And it came from these verses because the rabbis believed that the baptism that you needed to have was come back to the land and then I'll sprinkle water on you, make, make you clean, and then I'll change your heart. So what they, John the baptizer was saying was, come down to the Jordan River, go down into the water. Now that you're back in the land, maybe God will cleanse us and then he will give us a new heart, bring in Messiah, and it'll all be wrapped up. And I think that's what, exactly what John thought was going to happen. By the way, it's exactly what happened. They did come down. John did call them the repentance. Messiah did come. But there was a lot of stuff in between Messiah's first and second coming that John never knew. Why? Because it wasn't obvious. All I'm saying is that these are the passages from which baptism come. Let me do one last thing with you before I go. And that's the fourth of the, the, fourth of the four visions is actually uh, from chapter 40 through chapter 48, and no, I'm not gonna do eight chapters in one fell swoop. What I am gonna do is just pick out the theme of 40 to 48 and see if I can help you understand what the end of this book is about. But I want you to see that in chapter 40, verse one, you start off with the April 28th of the year 573. This is, by the way, the last prophecy of the book Sort of. There's one more piece, which is actually in chapter 29 and 30 that got stuck in there that actually comes from two years after this. Okay? We know it's stuck in there because it's dated. So apparently, Ezekiel had other prophecies that God chose not to preserve. There's one left over from Egypt that they stuck into the section that goes on the, you know, foreign nations, and they just shoved it in there in 29 and 30. But the last kind of organized part of the book is 40 to 48. And I want you to notice what it's about. This is an essay on worship. I think you'll look at it and you'll think it's all about a temple, but it's not. It's all about the future of worship. So you get to verse 1. It says, In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, 14th year after the city was taken, on that same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me there. Okay, where did he bring him? Verse 2, in the visions of God, he brought me into the land of Israel and he set me on a very high mountain and on it to the south, there was a structure like a city. So he brought me there and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze with a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand and he was standing in the gateway. And the man said to me, son of man, see with your eyes, hear with your ears, give attention to all that I am going to show you for you have been brought here in order to show it to you. Declare to the house of Israel all that you see. All right, he's, he's grabbed again. He's beamed over to Jerusalem, spiritually speaking. Physically, he's still in Babylon. Spiritually, he's in Jerusalem. What he's looking at is he's going to be looking at the area of a new temple. By the time this is written, the other temple had already been destroyed. It was destroyed in 586. This is 573. So there is no temple there. There's the ruins of a temple. But in the one that he sees, he sees an angelic man who has a measuring stick who's running around and it looks like they're getting ready to build a temple. Okay? Verse 5. Behold, there was a wall on the outside of the, te of the temple all around and the man's hand was a measuring rod of six cubits. So he had a measuring rod that was six times this. Remember, this is a cubit. So it's six times this, which is basically nine feet, okay? And um, each of them was a cubit and a hand breadth. So there was a cubit, 
and then this, another, what, four, inch, four and a half inches, something like that. Um, so he measured the thickness of the wall, one rod and the height, one rod. Okay, so he takes a rod, and how big is the rod? Six cubits is nine feet plus a hand breadth. So nine feet, let's say nine feet, five inches. Okay, that's the size of a rod. So he measured the thickness of the wall, and it was nine feet, five inches. At, and the height, of uh, it was nine feet, five inches. So you have essentially this big cube like wall around the city, okay? Then, he's just giving you this detail of the size of this wall, okay? And it says the guard room was one rod long and one rod wide, and there were five cubits between the guard rooms, and the threshold of the gate by the porch of the, uh, of the gate facing inward was one rod. And he measured the porch of the gate facing inward one rod. He measured the porch of the gate eight cubits and its side pillars two cubits and the porch of the gate was faced inward. The guard rooms of the, of the gate toward the east numbered three on one side and three of them uh, had uh, also the same measurement. The side pillars had the same measurement on each side. And he goes on and on and on like this for verse upon verse upon verse upon verse where you're going and then this was this big and then I saw this and this was this big and if you needed a picture somebody actually took the time to draw one. Okay? Here's the thing. Here's what I can tell you in summary. This is a much larger building than the building of the temple that had been there at the time of Solomon. It was a much larger building. So he says, I look at this and I see this, and I see that there is a, an incredible building there. And here's the thing. When you start looking at this, you have a couple of options. What is this? Over the centuries, people have tried to struggle with what these ch chapters are about and both Jews and Christians, some people have spiritualized it. What they say is that the whole thing is a view of ideal worship and there's no literal temple of God. But the problem is all these pesky details about sizes. Really, what does all that mean? Nothing. This is one rod, that's one rod. There's eight and then there's space and then there's another chamber and then there's this. In other words, wah, 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 worship. Ah. Does that sound like the God of the law who told you if there was mold on the fringe, you had to remove the garment? It, the God of such incredible specificity gives you not just one page. Keep going. We can go all the way through. Look at the uh, end of chapter 40. Uh, 40. The length of the porch, last, verse 49, was 20 cubits, and it's with 11 cubits. Go to the beginning of chapter 41. Maybe he finishes. No, he doesn't, in fact. Then he brought me to the nave and measured the side pillars, six cubits wide on a side, and its width was a side pillar, and the width of the entrance was 10 cubits. And, and go all the way to the end of chapter 41. Oh, let us see. Does he continue? Yes, he does. Verse 25. And there were carved on them and the doors of the nave, cherubim and palm trees, like those carved on the walls. And there was a threshold of wood on the front of the porch of the altar. And there were latticed windows and the palm trees on one side and on the other. And the sides of the porch, thus were the side chambers of the house and its threshold. Ah, oh, well, maybe he finishes in, in 41. No, he does not. Read on in 42. Then he brought me into the outer court, the way to toward the north. He brought me to the chamber, which was opposite the separate uh, area and opposite the building toward the north. And along that length, which was, by the way, 100 cubits, was the north door. The width was uh, 50 cubits. And so you say, well, well, Randy, maybe they finished this up in chapter 42. Oh, but they really don't. This goes on for more chapters. He goes down to the end of verse 42 and it says he measured it, verse 20, on all four sides and it had a wall around it, the length of 500 and the width of 500 to divide between the holy and the profane. Does this sound like it's a spiritual vision that means nothing? So either this is a spiritualized view or perhaps it's actually something that happens. So some people will go, well, wait a minute, really? This is a view of the temple as it was when it was rebuilt at the time of Jesus. If that's true, all the measurements are wrong. The number of gates are wrong. The number of doors are wrong. The number of pillars are wrong. The decorations are wrong. And virtually everything it says is wrong. So I got a problem. If it's not the first temple, 
and it's not the second temple, and there's only been two temples, then what are my other options? There's another temple going to be built. Dun, dun, dun. Another temple. But here's the thing. Christians have Jesus, and he paid it all. So what do you need a temple for? But see, the millennium's purpose is for God to fulfill to the Jewish people, bringing them back, giving them the king over the throne of David, and showing them what he meant by what he said. And though Jesus paid for sin once for all, most of what happened in the temple isn't about sin at all. It's about celebration, it's about worship, and it's about honoring God. Because you know that, you don't, you're not tempted to therefore dismiss the whole thing. Now here's the cool part. Right next to verse 43, verse 1, chapter 43, verse 1, 1 Kings 6 through 8. Because this will be the vision of the glory of God as he fills the temple. So if Ezekiel saw a temple, here's what he saw. He saw God placing a throne, bringing the people back to the land, and bringing the people back to a temple. My problem with all of this is if you spiritualize away the Jews in the story, none of this makes sense. None of it. But if the story just means exactly what it says, it means that God isn't going to end time until he brings the Jews back to their land, he changes their hearts, and he gives them another temple. Now what's interesting is that there's still sacrifices going on. Why would there be sacrifices? Well, remember, not all of them have to do with sin. But also, in Hebrews, we saw that idea that if Messiah were standing there and he were asked, would you go into the temple even though you've paid for sin, he would say, I would stand there at the altar and say, look at this lamb and what a picture he is of what I have done. In other words, sometimes the temple was supposed to foreshadow Jesus. Sometimes it was supposed to pronounce what Jesus already did. And when you look at first chapter 43, go to 43 for a second. It says, then he led me to the east gate, or to the gate that was facing to the east. And, you know, it's very funny. I got used to reading this in one version for so many years. And this version, the New American Standard, I still insert the old words from the other version. Anyway, verse 2. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. What's the way of the east? What was east of Israel? I mean, Jordan is east of Israel, but what's east of that? The Fertile Crescent, Mediterranean, uh, I mean, um, the Fertile Crescent, the um, Mesopotamian areas of Iran, Iraq. And he says, I'm going to bring them back from Babylon. I'm going to bring them back from all over. He says, then he says, um, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Who's talking? Who sounds like many waters? God, okay. God and the earth shone with his glory. So God is drawing the people, calling them from all over. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I, uh, he came to destroy the city, and the visions I saw when I was at the river Chabar, and I fell on my face. I realized it was God. So I've been standing here watching this guy measure all these walls and call off measurements. And after a couple chapters of that, I was standing around going, yeah, that's kind of great. I'm really glad to see there's really a big temple why would that be important to Ezekiel? Why would a big, huge temple be important to Ezekiel? Yeah, and the temple that he so loved was actually not good, and it was destroyed. But this one's beautiful. It's bigger. It's pristine. It's huge. It's got profoundly beautiful carvings all over the, the temple. And he steps back, and then he says... If that wasn't cool enough, then God came. And I've seen him before, so I knew, I knew it was him. I saw his glory coming. Verse 4, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate facing toward the east. Why is that important? Because that's where it left from. That's exactly how he left. In 8 through 11, that's that he left to the east. He went out to the Kidron Valley and he left to the east. By the way, the Kidron Valley is also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of God's Judgment. He left at the Valley of Judgment and returned in the same place. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of God filled the house. 
I want you to see that's exactly what you see in 1 Kings 6 through 8 when, when the smoke filled up the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the place in front of Israel. Now it's not happening in front of Israel, it's happening in front of Zeke. He's getting to see it. Then I heard one speaking to me from the house while a man was standing beside me. He said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever and the house of Israel will not again defile my holy name, neither will they uh, nor their kings by their harlotry or by the corpses of their kings when they die. By setting their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost with only the wall between me and them, and they have defiled my holy name by their abominations which they have committed, so I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put away their harlotry and their corpses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell among them forever. As for you, son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the plan. If they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the house, its structure, its exits, its ex entrances, all its designs, all its structures, and all its laws. And write it in their sight so that they may observe the whole design and all its statutes and do them. This is the law of the house. Its entire area on the top of the holy mountain all around shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. What's he saying? Did you catch it? It's not a trick. You read the law. This isn't a law you've ever seen. Ezekiel just essentially added to the code of law. What was it that he added? This is the plan. I want you to build it exactly as I tell you. It's never been built. This, what you are holding in your hands is the plan of the next temple. And it's a law of God that you build it exactly that size and shape and you do it exactly where I tell you. In other words, God says, Ezekiel, give them all the details. They're going to again sin. They're going to again defile my name. But when their heart is finally broken and when they finally want to follow me, they'll understand that this is what they're supposed to do next. And this will be the law. Did you know that I could take you to a place in Jerusalem where they are already training priests how to kill lambs? Where you can already see the casting for the menorah, for the great lampstand? Where you can go to a school if you are Jewish and you are a Kohen of a priestly family and you can learn to weave the cloth of the tunic that belongs to a priest. All of those things exist right now. I can take you to them. So what you're seeing is... Not only that, but look at this. There's going to be an altar of sacrifice. And, and the whole specification of it is in verses 13 through 17. And there's also going to be a, a, a specific way in which they're going to operate the various offerings that they have to uh, operate. And those are given to them. And there's also a specification for who runs the place, who polices it in chapter 44, and how the land is divided up by the people who have to oversee the temple in chapter 45, and the way in which they're going to collect the taxes for the coming time of the kingdom, all that's been specified. These are rules for a time that hasn't happened yet. But here's an interesting thing. Go down to 47, Ezekiel 47. <clears throat> then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, Water was flowing from the th under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under and from the right side of the house from the south of the altar. He brought me out by the way of the north gate. He led me around on the outside to the outer gate by way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side. <clears throat> He's starting to see a river forming in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem doesn't have a river on the surface. There is one, but it's underground. We know it's there. Geologically, we get water from it, <clears throat> but it's below ground. Something happens to the geology that breaks the ground in Jerusalem that causes the water to come to the surface. You don't know what it is yet, but you're going to find out what that event is in Zechariah. When Messiah comes in, Ze in Zechariah 9 through 12, he steps down onto the Mount of Olives and it divides the landscape. 
and the crack produces a river and Jerusalem gets a river. And the river flows in Zechariah all the way down to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea that has been going down, down, down goes up, up, up. And it becomes a living uh, body of water. It's dead now because it's settling and the level of salts is going up as it evaporates. But when the water pours in, it'll go the other way. And here's what it says. He, he, it says that he measured, verse 4, he, uh, measured a thousand and led me through. He measured, a, uh, I got to go back to verse 3, I'm sorry. When the, when the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits. He led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, the water reaching his knees. Again, he measured a thousand, and he led me through the water, and the water was reaching his loins. What he's doing is he's taking the rods and taking them further down the valley. And the further down he goes, the bigger the river becomes, the deeper it becomes. So it started off ankle deep, then it's knee deep, now it's loin deep. And it says, um, Again, verse 5, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not ford, for the water had risen enough water to swim in, a river that could not be forded. In other words, I couldn't stand up in the rushing water anymore. It kept sweeping me down. And so he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, the bank of the river was there, many other trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said, these waters go toward the eastern region and down into the Arava, which is the, 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 um, the landscape. There's a desert that is in the depression just south of the Dead Sea, and that's the Arava. It's a, it's a dry desert gully. It looks kind of, sort of like um, Death Valley, okay? And he says, uh, do you see this? He says, have you seen this? It's going down into the Arava. And then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea became fresh water. You're talking about the Dead Sea, which right now is being harvested for salt and for chemicals. But he says so much water will come in, it will make the water no longer a salt water, but like the Jordan, it will become, it'll push the salts and minerals back and become a living base of water in the north basin of the Dead Sea. It will become, it will come about that, ver that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. There will be many fish. We're talking the Dead Sea. There's not a fish in the Dead Sea. It, when you go uh, to Israel with me, you will go to the Dead Sea. You can lie on your back and read a newspaper in the Dead Sea. Like you're on a raft, except for you're not. The water is so viscous, it's about the thickness of baby oil when you feel it, but actually the viscosity is so high that when you lie down in it, you can just lie on top of the water, which is a very strange experience. You can drown in the Dead Sea with basically two teaspoons of water, because if you get that stuff in your lungs, you can't get it out, which means you'd never, ever, ever dive into the Dead Sea. If you get a drop of that water in your eyes, you will walk on the water all the way out, okay? <laughs> Um, if you shave your legs the night before, you will find that every nick has life and you will know of its life. Okay? It's a, it's a, it's a great experience. Everybody should do it once. Okay? Um, yeah, everybody should go in the Dead Sea. You got to do it. You got to do it. I mean, yeah, but that's, it's, it's just a cool experience. You, I mean, you've never been in water where you just could just lay there. I mean, that's just fun. Anyway, it's something I'll get you to do, and I'll watch. Um, <laughs> verse 10, And it will come about that the fishermen will stand beside it, from En Gedi to Enaglaim. There will be a place for the spreading out of their nets. The fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea. Just like the Mediterranean, the Dead Sea will have fish in it. Now, what we don't know is, is this connected to another sea? Is there a canal cut? What happened? All we know is that water is pouring through Jerusalem according to what he sees, and that it's fresh water, and that fish are down by the Dead Sea. And so what I want you to see is he says, but its swamps and its marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. That's a good detail. The salt gets pushed away from it. It doesn't leave. It's not all fresh water. 
There's marshy land in which the salt bins and basins are pushed back. In my view, the north becomes fresh, the south becomes salt pans. By the way, the south is where the salt pans are and where we normally stay at the spa hotels. And you can get a good massage because Ellie, my massage guy, is there. At any rate, verse 12, by the river on its bank and on one side or the other, we grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because of their, the, their water flows from the sanctuary and their fruit will be for food and for their leaves for healing. What does that sound like? Garden of Eden? Let me give you some other verses that look just like that. Go to the end of Revelation and you will see that there was a river running through the center and trees on both sides for the healing of the nations and they bear fruit each month in their time. In other words, John mentions this exact thing. The rest of the vision has to do with the boundaries and divisions of the land that were put together and where the priests live because once they start up the land again, they have to cut the land up and they have to give some to the Levitical priests, which means the priests are operating. All right, what's the last, last message of the book? What is 40 through 48 about? What I want you to understand is what it's about is that God is going to be worshiped again in his land. He's going to bring the people back. He's going to get a sanctuary back. It's going to have a, a landscape that is going to again have a specific size building. Listen, if everything God said concerning the coming of Messiah in his first coming is literal, then why are we not willing to accept that this is literal in his second coming? So here's the thing. If you are a graduate of GCBI and you learn these details, you could be an architect for the third temple. You could walk in and say, oh, excuse me, excuse me, a little bit to the right there. That, that goes another rod over, please. Thank you. And you could build this thing. God gave incredible specific directions. And you go, why would he do that? This doesn't mean anything to the church. No, it doesn't. It's for the guy who has to build it. It's the law of the house. By the way, it's called three times the law of the house. Why? Because it's the law of the house. You don't need it. They do. And on the day they need it, it's already written. Just like a lot of revelation that isn't to you. It's to whoever's in it. They'll understand some things you won't understand about it.